I'm Wendy Catewell, an experienced counsellor and psychotherapist. I work with so many people who feel that they're the only one struggling with the issues that they share with me. Possibly, like many of you, they feel so alone. And so the aim of this podcast is to talk to guests who have their own stories to share, their experience of the struggles that they've been through, or maybe they're continuing to live with, offering their insights as well as their inspiring journey. So let me introduce my guest. I've got um, Louisa Whitney with me today, and she's um, she's an old friend. She's become an old friend. I don't mean old that she's old. I mean that she's become a familiar friend and somebody that I've got to know really well over the last two years. She is, um, she compliments what I do. I compliment what she does. Louisa is a family mediator who helps separating couples to, to, uh, sorry, I'll get it right in a minute. Sorry, to create tailor-made solutions and I think this is lovely she, I mean, she's a she is a qualified lawyer but she helps couples connect once they decided to part whereas my my idea is that I hope couples can communicate better when they're together but they do sometimes part so yeah um and I think the conversation we last had when we had when we were out was that communication and how it creates so many complications, so many difficulties. Would you agree, Louisa? I know you will. <laughs> I, I definitely do, Wendy. And thank you for your lovely, lovely introduction. It's great to be here. Especially as I stumbled over what you did. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we had that conversation when we met a few weeks ago, didn't we, about how miscommunication, lack of communication, et cetera, create so many problems what is it the big thing that comes up for you do you think I think the biggest thing that comes up in the mediation room is that usually a relationship has been breaking down for a little while and what tends to happen is that the parties involved stop communicating with each other but they kind of fill in the blanks in their head about what the other person's thinking, what the other person's feeling, and they take bits of what's happening as evidence that what they're thinking about what the other person's thinking is true. So even by the time they get into the mediation room, there can be so many misconceptions, miscommunications and misunderstandings about what each person wants, what each person's feeling, um, things that the other person might have said, what their meaning was behind that. Um, and particularly what they want to achieve from the separation, which can often create lots of fears in people. So you can be starting from sort of quite a backward standpoint in looking at what each person wants and what their understanding is of what the other person wants. Yes, and I, I would agree in the same principle because I people have got into bad habits and they think they know what the other person is going to say or... Um, I think the other thing is that they've dragged other stuff, either from previous relationships or from their own lives. They drag it into the relationship and they've already decided what the other person is going to say or thinks or, yeah. Definitely. You know, we all have baggage that comes with us from things that have happened to us. And if you've got something that you're sensitive to, then if you see something or smell something that's a bit like what the baggage you've dealt with is, you know, you're going to be hypersensitive to that and it's going to make you react. Mm. Yeah. And I think one of the other things that I, I notice is that, um, that listening to reply or listening to actually respond to in a way, or actually listening to hear what the other person has to say. Because I think, I don't know about you, but I hear it in all walks of life that people, they're not really listening with full attention. They're listening and they're halfway through, they switch off and they're practicing what they're going to say in response. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And it's understandable given we live in kind of busy and overwhelming worlds. I talk a lot about people who listen to respond 
or listen to let, let's start with listen to react and that is i think you think something i'm going to listen only enough to think yep that's definitely what you think and i'm cross about it and then i'm going to give it to you with both barrels or listening to respond is you're kind of filtering the information to find out and a classic example of this is if i ask my daughter what she wants for dinner she's going to give me a long speech about what she really wants but really the words i'm listening for are pasta chicken that kind of thing too often we don't listen to properly understand what it is the other person's saying or you know what it is they're trying to communicate mm. yeah I, I i agree with you wholeheartedly there and and there is or or as you say they're triggered by a word and therefore they're on the attack because they feel they feel attacked so they're going to go on the attack and they're not really listening to what's being said so yeah i agree with you there yeah it's a it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because everybody tends to do it, and you say we're bombarded with so much stuff daily um, that we have to filter some of it out, I guess. Yeah, I I one of the conclusions I've come to lately, and I speak from personal experience on this, is that sometimes we don't realise how overstimulated we are. You know, you can have a conversation with someone, you've got a worry kind of bubbling away in the background you're on your phone you've got an email you've got to deal with you've seen something on social media that is an awful lot of things to be dealing with within a short space of time and often we don't realize how much we've got how many browser windows we've got open in our heads to sort of use a phrase mm. yeah and i i think about you know our hard drive is just it's ready to crash you know it's so overloaded that at some point it's going to go bang and and we can't cope with it anymore so yeah you're right and I guess that's where couples have such busy busy lives that they're trying to juggle full-time jobs um kids getting them to school or nursery or whatever else and with their sick and how to manage their job and the expectations let alone try and find some time together or even space for themselves and I think that's why I see that car. they don't give they they don't give themselves the space, or the other pressures outside don't allow the space for them to actually stop and be able to think reasonably and 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 listen and yeah, take that time out for themselves and each other. Yeah, communication is either kind of intensely practical, like you know, don't forget you're doing the school run today. We need milk because you walk past the shop. Have you put the bins out? You know, all of those kind of things. Yeah. It's not, how are you feeling at the moment? What are your dreams? You know, what is it? You know, those kind of bigger conversations. And I think in the worst case scenarios, people aren't even managing to say, don't forget you're doing the school run or can you get milk? And that is just then when the kind of resentments build up about, God, you couldn't even do the school run. You couldn't even get milk when you were supposed to. And then things just start to kind of simmer with the resentments. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. But I told you, well, if you were telling someone while they were trying to manage the kids, cook the dinner and, um, I don't know, listen to whatever else they were doing or, or, or you should say we reply to that email then they're not we you know I hear this this phrase multitasking and yes we can simple multitask we can walk and we can talk at the same time but you cannot listen to your toddler talking while trying to listen to your partner by at the same time trying to write a text or a message it's not possible you mind switch and therefore if you're mind switching it means that you're missing possibly vital bits of information mm, absolutely and i have to say i used to be a real proud i can multitask and do loads of things and i have had to accept over the last few years that actually walking and talking is probably about as many things as I can do together. And if I'm typing an email or a text message and someone wants to talk to me, they're either going to have to wait or I'm going to have to stop typing it because I just can't do it. And it really, I've noticed how much I feel overstimulated when that happens. Um, and I think we just need to be aware of that and give ourselves a bit of a break because we're just managing too many things at any one time. And often it feels impossible to put things down 
but sometimes we have to and that can require sort of thought process that again requires communication so sometimes one person is thinking i want to live differently but they don't have any space to have that conversation yeah exactly right and i think it is so you know that that complex multitasking it's not a failure in us it's just our brain can't do it that's it end of so let yourself off the hook there Louise that it's not that you're not able to do it anymore you probably never could you just fooled yourself you could <laughs> it's just the brain cannot do it and that's it you can prove it to yourself you can actually try and watch something on television and write an email at the same time and see how much you miss out it's not possible so yes Women always pride themselves on being able to multitask, but there's simple multitasking. The stuff that you can do together, like wash up and scream at the kids, if that's what's going on. <laughs> yeah, we do fool ourselves. Um, yeah, it's, it's tricky. And I think one of the other things that I find so often is um, misunderstanding of a word or a phrase. Yeah because we've grown up in our family system of origin and a particular word has had a meaning and then you relay that to somebody else and that could have a completely different meaning mm. and that can really, really cause so many problems, can't it? I, I have to say that resonated with me a lot because my husband and I grew up in different areas of the country and I cannot tell you the amount of times he's come out with a phrase and I've just stood there thinking, what on earth do you mean? I have never heard this phrase ever. What are you talking about? And we then have to kind of unpick what he means by it and then work it out. And it's always funny because it's just these kind of phrases that he thinks are really common and I don't. But absolutely. And you tend to read anything in line with your view of the person that's saying it or texting it to you or whatever. And that's definitely one of the things that comes up in my work, because if you automatically think someone is, I don't know, let's say that they're cross with you about something and they send a message about something, you'll assume it's cross, even though for them, it was just, I only had two minutes between these meetings and I needed to reply. Yeah. Oh, and if we lead on to texting, Oh, my goodness me. I always think the written word is one dimensional and can be read in so many different ways, depending on the person who's writing it, the phrases that are used and the person receiving it. Boy, does that lead to some arguments. <laughs> uh, absolutely, it does. And, uh, you know, as I say, partly because you're reading it in line with the other person, but also silly things. Like I remember having clients where one of them used to complain that, the other one sent messages very late and that they found really difficult because they were just about to go to bed and then they'd worry about it. Whereas the other person's point of view was, well, do you know what? I'm at work all day. I've got to get the children to bed. That's often the first time that I get to talk about these, to actually think about things and then reply to the message that had been sent maybe earlier in the day or perhaps, you know, a few days earlier. And so often it's about managing that kind of communication and texts. If you don't want to get texts from a certain person before you go to bed, then, you know, putting a boundary on your phone or not looking at them or things mm. like that, it just can be really helpful. Just because someone wants to send a message then, that doesn't mean that's when you've got to read it. Yeah, and I think that is one of the biggest things, isn't it, with modern technology, that instant, you know, if the phone rings or a text comes in, people just pick it up. There's no filtering, no boundaries. I mean, I could be with somebody um, having a conversation and suddenly the, their phone will ring and there's not an excuse me, do you mind or anything. I've been with clients who completely ignored me. They picked up the phone. They've seen a text or I had taken a message. They've talked amongst themselves. And I'm sitting there thinking, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> And it, it's weird. Yeah. I just find that you've got, you know, that that has to, it's almost, it's got to be answered now, whereas actually it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. And, and I think that that is another thing, so many pressures on us. I think phones are so distracting as well. I mean, I was talking mm. to a friend who was saying that they were talking about something and the person they were with had picked up their phone to check something for the conversation they were having and had then got completely distracted by things on their phone. And they said they sat there for nearly half an hour waiting for them to be booked at the phone. And it is just, you know, 
I've done it myself. You pick up your phone because you need to do a particular thing and then there's a notification, there's something else and before long you've forgotten what it is you need to do. <laughs> yeah, it kind of, it's that added, isn't it? Just that, that added kind of crazy thing of you get to the top of the stairs to get something, you pick up something else and you forget the thing that you, you went upstairs for. It's, just, it's that kind of scenario, isn't it? But with a phone, you're right, there are too many distractions. I hear what you're saying, those notifications. I guess it is a case of unless you have to switch the damn things off because they are so distracting. But then I think even with, with couples, I find that that people get really upset with each other if they don't get a response immediately. Yeah. You know, well, you're not bothering, you you haven't don't consider me important, you know, what's wrong, and all of those things. And you, you just that adds that adds just to the 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 upset and the distraction and the worry and oh, everything else that goes on and the arguments as well. Yeah. yeah. And there's that kind of irony, isn't there? Of, I want you to be someone that will respond to messages quickly. But if we're spending time together and you pick up your phone to respond to somebody else's message quickly, then I'm going to be quite annoyed that you're not kind of connecting in with this time. It's, it, you know, it's a difficult thing to manage. And I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way, but perhaps we all need to do it more consciously and mindfully than we actually do and think about boundaries with all aspects of our life, really, our phones, you know our demands that are placed upon us yeah yeah I, I I'd, I'd agree with you there uh, absolutely and I, I do have this thing about phones I must I think fat mobile phones are a 21st century addiction that's it you know we are just addicted to them and I think it is being mindful and I'm just as bad at times you know if I've got a space where I think, oh, you know, a, a moment to myself, that I'll just check my phone, see if anything's come through. <sighs> Crazy. But I think it is being really mindful about it. And, you know, the thing is that it's awful. If you're sitting with your partner in a room and you're distracted with a text with somebody else, you're having a conversation outside, how does the per other person feel? They can feel excluded. They can feel rejected. I mean, it brings up so many things, doesn't it? You can't be bothered to talk to me. You're not investing in our relationship, but you've got time to talk to Jane down the road or, or something yeah. you've only seen earlier today. Or Yeah. And I just think, well, how do you expect your relationship to have any value or, or you're investing in it if you're just, just going to do that? I don't know if I'd go as far as sometimes it's almost cheating. I don't know. There's a bit of it that in my head going, but you're actually... You're actually rather spend time with somebody else. Is it? Is that? I know we can look at cheating in all different ways, but you're not actually talking to me. You're excluding me, and you, you're bringing somebody else into the relationship who is actually feeling excluded. Weird. I, I I know I know it's, and there's so many tensions that come up. And obviously, from your point of view, you're trying to sort of help people iron them out. Whereas in my point of view, they've been insurmountable but they often are played out in the mediation room I think it, it highlights two things to me one is the fundamental difference between listening and feeling listened to oh, because yeah. someone can say I am listening to you I'm just trying to finish this off but if you don't feel heard and you don't feel that someone is listening to something that you think is important then that can make you feel pretty pretty rubbish and that you are not important or valuable to that person yeah. I also think it raises questions about the priorities that we have. And again, all the things that we're trying to juggle, you know, sometimes if you think that something is one of your top priorities, then you've got to juggle things down a bit. And actually, sometimes I wonder whether there's even an exercise in looking at what your priorities are, what your values are, understanding those as a person. So you're not trying to keep everything at number one. You do know, right. My family is my, you know, my top priority. So when I'm with my family, I am not going to go on my phone or I'm only going to go on my phone for, you know, an hour in the evening, whatever it is. It's that, you know, this is time when other things don't matter. This is what matters here. And, and again, that comes back to being mindful and conscious of having that awareness that they are a priority and you want to show people that they're a priority. But it's not always easy when you feel like you're firefighting and sinking. 
No, no, and I, I agree. And I think it is, and we're talking about family life, that's a, a much bigger pressure, I think, on, on, on people these days who do have families and high powered jobs or demanding jobs and just trying to juggle everything, I think is, is very, very difficult. But you're right, it, I think it is making that connection, but it's, it's that connection that is, um, that is meaningful and set aside. And, it, you know, connecting just for five minutes a day makes all the difference. And I, I think that's it, letting the other person know that they really matter that you yeah. really do care about them, whether it's your partner, your child, your friend, whoever you're with, letting them, them know that they, they, they do matter. And I think that's, that's such a big thing. It yeah. doesn't take a lot. And it comes back to kind of, I suppose, being in the moment and whoever you're with at that moment, giving them their, your attention because it's yeah. about that moment and it's not about making arrangements for the next moment or whatever you're doing it's that you're there and that person's getting your attention yeah yeah I would agree wholeheartedly yeah uh, and I just want to kind of go on to another thing that I notice a lot when when I'm with a couple and um, I ask one of them what how they're feeling and you can see that they're trying to explain how they feel about the relationship or the you know what's going on or their distress, and I ask their partner, what does it feel like right now hearing what your partner is saying? And um, what I get nine times out of 10 is, I've heard it so many times before, mm. and they just brush it aside rather than, no, I'm asking what, it, what does it feel like right now? Yeah. And sometimes I still get the same response, but there are other times when they, I get a sense that, they work, have the ability then to really connect and step into the other person's shoes. Yeah. And I think that's what gets missed because oh, I've heard it all before and they blank it out. And oh yeah, they're just going on and on and on. But actually they're not really, they're not listening. Mm. They're just gone, it's just a monotonous rubbish that I've heard it all before. And yeah, they switch off. Yeah. yeah. So you get the result of that when they you're trying to get them to part amicably or, or in a way that is that suits them and is, is better and healthier. Yeah, definitely. And I I think there's an element sometimes that people we we as humans can find other people's feelings quite difficult to deal with. Um, and I think particularly if you as a couple have hit against a particular issue, and I think a lot of couples have the same argument over and over again, and it starts differently and it sounds different at the start, but ultimately it's the same argument. And I think people do kind of tune out of it and don't find a way forward. And so that again repeats itself in the mediation room because for exactly the reasons you've been saying, the person doesn't feel heard. They don't feel that their emotions have been witnessed. And it can sometimes become a fundamental issue in the separation. So I think differences in parenting is often something that comes up in my world and differences between couples. So then that obviously feeds into making arrangements when you separate as to what the children might need, what they need from mum and dad. And then they have different views on that. And then that's just kind of throwing salt in the wound of things that were difficult during the separation. And you can get exactly the same things play out in mediation. One person's very upset and the other person is a bit, I've heard it all before. I don't want to hear it now. And I think that also partly comes from a place that they don't feel heard themselves either. So there's an element of, well, you haven't heard me. So why should I hear you sometimes? Mm, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Kind of tit for tat kind of attitude, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you can't be bothered. Why should I? And there is. Yeah. I've heard that many times as well. And that's sad because somebody's got to break the cycle somewhere. Otherwise, it just keeps repeating, doesn't it? It does. And this is one of the things that I often say when I'm talking to clients about effective communication. There's that element of, well, why should I bother if the other person isn't? But actually, if you just change the way that you're dealing with things, there can be a ripple effect from that that can then change how things are done. I talk a lot about the, the what I call the four C's, so the four pillars of effective communication, which are calm, constructive, conscious and compassionate. And I think those are just the four fundamental parts. And finding that compassion for someone else can often mean that 
you just approach things a little bit differently. You kind of, you see their views as valid, you accept that you don't agree, but perhaps they're also hurting or they also have frustrations and that can just be a bit of a turning point. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and I see the same. It's, it's, it's if we, we can't make somebody else change, we can't, haven't got that ability, but by changing things ourselves, as you say, it so often creates a ripple effect and it elicits a different response from the other person because they're getting a different experience so yeah it is I agree with you I mean it's like you're banging your head against a brick wall if you keep doing it you're going to get the same result so if you stop banging your head against a brick wall thought about it and how maybe thinking about well perhaps if I used a hammer instead (laughs) instead of my head (laughs) I might get the nail in (laughs) I love the metaphor, Wendy. Yeah. I mean, I talk about there's a quote that I think is attributed to Albert Einstein that says the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And, you know, you have the same conversation, the same things. It is exactly like banging your head against a brick wall. And let's face it, it's not much fun, is it? No. And you certainly won't get the nail in the wall either. (laughs) No, you'll just get a headache. Oh, Louisa, it's been just really good talking to you today. And I think we we talked about some really tricky things, but I think quite lightheartedly as well. And hopefully people can will find it, yeah, not such heavy going, because I think it can be heavy going. We just sit there and say, when are you going to do something different? How are you going to make some changes? How about you try thinking about your communication, you know, the way you, you do communicate? And what could you do differently to get a different response and outcome yeah I just think people could do that so readily yeah definitely small changes and as we know you know what I think there's another saying isn't there about from 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 acorns mighty oaks grow exactly yeah exactly I agree with you it's been absolutely delight talking today Louisa thank you so much how's an easy way of people getting in touch with you The easiest way to get in touch with me is via my website, which is lkwfamilymediation.co.uk. And that has details of how to contact me on it. It also has a blog with over 200 separation related articles and various free resources that people can download to help them manage things as constructively as possible. That's brilliant. I'll put all the details in the show notes, but yeah, um, so people can look at it. But just LKW. um, Family Mediation family mediation brilliant thanks louisa it's just been great and i just hope everybody else finds it as interesting as we have (laughs) thank you wendy thank you for having me as a guest i've really enjoyed it i hope you found this episode interesting as well as helpful do get in touch if you would like to learn more about working with me my email address is info at wendy capewell .co.uk Take good care of yourself. Until next time. Mm-hmm.